43, welcome back. Thanks for hanging with me as we get through that keynote. So I want to talk about um, experiments and sampling techniques. That's what the second half of this keynote is about. So random sampling, why do we do it? It allows us to generalize our findings to this population. It removes bias. And it looks like my keynote's going out of order. Cool. Um, so the the most common method or the one that we talk about a lot is the SRS. So when I say SRS, I'm talking about simple random samples, right? And there's three methods. There's the slips of paper, the stuff on your calculator, right? The random int and then the random digit table. And this is the method that I would have to use in class or on an exam because that's the only way that you it will force you to get the same, all of you to get the same answer. Um, but if I'm doing it in the real world, I would definitely use technology. And I, this slips of paper, this is just old school. I have to mention that because I used to do it back in my day. All right, so let's talk about how we can use our calculator, right, so that we can do it out in the real world um, and then, uh, and see how, excuse me, I can't use my own words. Let's <laughs> see how we can use our calculator to get a random sample. So you find that random int, um, if you hit your math button on your calculator and you head over to the PRB menu and it's option five. And if you just do one comma 12, right? If you put the low and the high in, it'll pump out one number at a time, which is great, right? And you can do any lows and highs and you can repeat this if you want, right? So this was from one to 20,147. That's a huge sample, or I should say a huge population, right? And you can put observation 4413 into your sample and then observation 4949 into your sample. And keep in mind when you're using the calculator, you can get the same number more than once, right? It is possible for me to hit 4949 again. It might not be probable, but it's possible, right? So your calculator is always sampling with replacement. And that's how true sampling should be done. But out in the real world, we usually sample without replacement. And we'll talk about how you can do that and when you can do that when we get to chapter eight. All right, if you put three numbers into this command, it'll go low and high as one to six and it'll get you three numbers at a time. So that's why you see the output of three digits. And, and here we go, we had a repeat, which is fine. All right, you can also store those numbers into a list. Now this, believe it or not, this is the equivalent, the calculator equivalent of flipping a coin. So let's say you go to a party, and you, or you're just in a social situation where somebody says, hey, I need you to flip a coin, and you don't have any coins on you, but you do have your calculator on you. You can do this. You can say heads is zero, or you could say tails, and you could say tails is one, and you can say, hey, flip either heads or tails and do it 100 times, right? So you can see this went tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, tails, and if you hit that little STO key, which is above your on key in your calculator and it has a little like sort of triangle on it, it'll store information into a list. And then if you went into L1, you could actually see all of that information. All right, now the types of sampling, we have five methods. We have the SRS, we have stratification, clustering, systematic, and convenience. All right, and these three involve grouping your, your population ahead of time, all right? And, None of these other options after the SRS, none of them are SRSs in and of themselves because once you start grouping things before you make your selection, it limits the types of groups you can get on the back end. And what I mean by that is if you just do a simple random sample, any group is possible. All right, any group is possible, meaning I could get uh, let's say we were breaking folks up into, um, if we were at a high school, maybe we're breaking folks up into 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And let's say we didn't even group anybody, right? If I just took 50 students from a high school, it's possible that I only got 10th and 11th graders, right? It might not be probable, but it's possible, right? It's possible I got some from each grade, all right? But when you SRS things, anything is possible, now, if I was gonna stratify by grades, that means I would take some ninth graders, some 10th graders, some 11th, some 12th. And what that means is the group where you only got 10th and 11th graders, the ones that we said was possible last time out, that's no longer possible, all right? And that's why it fails to be technically an SRS, all right? Because not every group is possible. 
All right, so stratifying, right? When we stratify, we break folks up into groups. And in this method, you're going to take some from each group. When you cluster, you break them into groups and you take all of some groups. So where before I said if we were stratifying, we would take some 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. If I was clustering, I might just take all of the 9th graders. That's it. I'm just going to take a group, a giant cluster. Systematic is when you do like every third person, every fifth person. Convenience is when you walk into the lunchroom right, and you just take the first 50 folks you see. Okay. All right. So let's say we had this population of only 12 folks, right? So we have some red folks, some green folks, and some blue folks. And I want to do an SRS of size four. And I'm going to talk about the calculator commands you could use here. So if I wanted an SRS of size four, I would label my population from one to 12, which I had, and I would take four of them. So if I got 10, two, eight, and five, you can see that those would be my, the folks that make it their way into my sample. Okay, great, SRS. And I want you to hear that if you're taking this SRS of size four, any group is possible. Right, it's possible that these numbers would have been one, two, three, four, right? It's possible they would have been one, two, three, five. It's possible they would have been one, two, three, six. You can see anything is possible, literally, any group is possible. And on the next set of um, sampling methods, not every group is possible. So let's go ahead and take a stratified sample of size four. And I'm just gonna break these folks up into their colors. All right, so we have the blue folks, the red folks, and the green folks. Now, if I want a stratified sample of size four, you want your sample to represent your population, all right? You just want it to be a smaller subset of that. And where I'm going with this is if I need to take four folks, and you can see that just inside this sample, excuse me, in this population, I have twice as many red folks, right? Twice as many red folks as green and blue. So what that means is I want to have twice as many red folks in my sample, right? So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one blue person, two red people, and I'm going to take one green person, right? And that's going to get me my sample of four. So if I want to go in here and just pick one person, I'm going to relabel this one, two, and three, right? And then I'm going to take one number in there. So that's going to be person 10. Here I'm going to relabel these folks, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm going to get two of them, and it looks like it's person five and person one. And I'm going to do the same thing for the green folks, all right, and let me get rid of all that mark, markings there, and there you can see my stratified sample, and you see that I have two red folks in there, and I have a green and a blue, all right? My sample represents my population just on a smaller scale. All right, and I want to point out that not every group was possible. If I'm going this method, there is no way for me to get one, two, three, four. Right? That is an impossible. Oh, actually, just kidding. I just looked at it. It is possible. Hold on. There is no way for me to get five, six, seven, eight. I can't have that combo pop out. And when I was just doing the SRS, when I was doing one, twelve, one on the last slide, so when we were doing random int for one, twelve, not one, excuse me, one, twelve, four, it was possible. Five, six, seven, eight came back out, all right? And that's just impossible here. And again, that's why it fails to meet the definition of an SRS. Okay, now let's take a look at clustering. All right, you could cluster by color again, but just for the sake of changing it up, I'm gonna cluster by position. So I'm gonna break folks up into pairs. So maybe this was a classroom, right? And here's a partner, here's a partner, here and here. Now I have six clusters of two folks. And if I want a cluster sample of four, that means I wanna take two clusters. So I wanna take, let's, let me change colors here. Let's say maybe I want this cluster and this cluster. I don't know. But if I have six clusters, I wanna do random int one to six and give me two of them. And you see three and six popping back out. And I would have labeled this one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm gonna get three and six. And there you can see my cluster sample of size four, okay? All right, then we could do systematic samples of size four. Well, if I have a systematic sample, what I really wanna do is if I want four 
folks, it means I need four groups. Right, so if I take a look at 12 and I divide it by four, that means I wanna put them into groups of three, and that's what you see me doing here. Group of three, group of three, group of three, group of three. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna look at this first group and I wanna choose one person. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this calculator command in of saying, hey, between one and three, give me one person. Okay, great. So they gave me person two, they gave me the middle person. So I'm gonna take the middle person in this group, the middle person in this group, and the middle person in this group. So I'm always taking the second person in each group. But another way of saying that is I start with number two, right? Here's my starting point. And then I go every third person. All right? there's three more here, three more here. And that's what we're looking at. We sample every third person, and there is my systematic sample of size four. Okay, so in terms of statistical studies, right, we've got the observational study and the experiment. Studies, no treatments are imposed, right? no cause and effect relationship can be concluded, and it includes surveys, which is the most common form or I won't say most common, but it's pretty common to do surveys. Experiments, we actually impose a treatment and a cause and effect relationship can be concluded. And this is huge. So that is how you get a cause and effect relationship. This explanatory variable quite literally explains and causes this response variable. And we are only allowed to say that in an experiment, right? That's what we're using in the world of statistics. Okay. So in terms of vocab, you got the explanatory variable, which in your math classes you called X, all right? But we call it explanatory. And a lot of times there are treatments involved, all right? And they're the different values or components of the explanatory variable, all right? And an experimental unit is the object or the individual that we're going to measure. A lot of times it's people or animals, all right? And whatever you think your explanatory variable is, you, maybe you give somebody uh, a drug and you're gonna measure some kind of response, like maybe pain level, all right? So explanatory variable X, response variable Y, all right? And then there's the good old confounding variables. And there are so many terms that go with this. Confounding factor, hidden variable, lurking, confound, confounder, la la, extraneous, la 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 la, so many things. And I'll give you an example of them. So we'll think about ice cream consumption and the number of drownings. So these two variables are positively related meaning as ice cream consumption rises, so does the number of drownings. So you can see over here, right? Ice cream consumption's going up, drownings are going up. There's a positive relationship, right? A positive linear relationship, if you will. So does ice cream consumption cause drowning? Meaning if you eat more ice cream, is that going to cause you to drown, right? Do they have a, and I'll put it here, a causal, oops, let me, not, let me actually write it correctly, causal relationship. Right? Meaning, did we run an experiment? Did we have two groups where we fed a whole bunch of folks some ice cream and we didn't feed the other folks ice cream and then we put them in a pool or something like that? None of that happened because what's happening here is that there's a confounding variable and it's the weather, right? So when it's hot, we tend to eat more ice cream. And when it's hot, people tend to go out in the water more, whether that's the ocean, a lake, or a pool. And that's the causal variable relationship, excuse me, and these two are just positively correlated. And you will hear this phrase, especially when we get into chapter 12, correlation does not equal causation. So just because two variables are positive real, positively related, it doesn't mean one causes the other, right? The only way to have a causal relationship is if we were running an experiment. Okay, so we got single blinding and double blinding. So in a single blind, the experiment, excuse me, the subjects do not know if they are getting the treatment or the placebo, or possibly the evaluator does not know if the subject has been given the treatment or placebo. And if you can, you wanna go to a double blind, right? Where the person handling, handing out the treatments or the person evaluating the results doesn't, well, excuse me, they both don't know um, which subjects are in which groups, right? And this is just to remove some bias. So times when, I, I had mentioned it in the video, times when you won't have a single blind experiment is when you have two treatments 
and the subject might know which one they got. And so one that comes to mind is um, flu shots, right? So there used to be, I think, well, still, there's a flu shot, right? And then there was a flu nasal spray. I think they've done away with this. If you're still getting a flu nasal spray, give me a shout. I'm curious. Um, but what I mean by this is if you were the subject, you would know if you got the nasal spray or the flu shot, right? There's no way to hide that from you because, you, you know, you're either getting a shot or you're getting something put up your nose, right? So you would know, but then the person evaluating you shouldn't know. That was how you could keep that one single blind. And that would be an example of where you actually couldn't make one double blind. And that happens sometimes. Okay. And a lot of times we have a control group that either gets no treatment or gets a placebo or some kind of established treatment. And there are times when you don't want to give your control group a treatment. So for example, or I should say you don't want to give your control group the placebo. So if you're testing a treatment for a sprained ankle, you want to have a group that gets no treatment because the sprained ankle is going to heal on its own. And you need to see that your treatment, maybe you have some kind of new ACE bandage, you want to show that your treatment gets better faster than the control group. Okay. All right. And so the placebo effect, right? You want the treatment group and the control group to be as equal as possible so that the only different between, difference between the groups is the treatment itself. So a placebo gets used all of the time. It's a fake treatment. It's used to equalize the psychological effects between the groups. And I can't quite remember now, but I think I read an article that said um, if people get shots, like, you know, like I was talking about that flu shot before, that tends to work better in terms of a placebo. And then I think pills are next. You know what? I don't remember. I'm going to stop talking because I can't remember. I'm going to have to re read some article. Anywho, so the placebo, again, like I said, it's, it's used to equalize these... Oh man, psychological effects. Okay. Oh, and that's the end of my slide. That's why this one's freaking out. Okay. So with that, you made it to the end of the chapter one keynote. So thanks for being so patient. I know this one's long. Like I said, chapter one and chapter two, they're very long chapters. All right. But thanks so much, gang. If you have any questions, send me a message on Canvas, get in touch. We'll chat and we'll figure it all out. All right. Take care. Bye.